I will just start off with a bit of an introduction to tailor-made. Um, so first of all, what is a tailor-made holiday? Now, a lot of people don't really even know what that word actually means. And really, it's just a completely bespoke wildlife holiday, which is designed um, completely around you, your specific interests and experiences. So um, it might be that you have a particular bird that you've always wanted to see and you really want to focus all of your efforts throughout the holiday on that particular species. And we can create a very tailored specific package for you. It might be on the other end of the extreme that this is your first wildlife holiday or your first visit to Africa or, or anywhere else. And you would like us to create something all encompassing to give you the very best of, of uh, wildlife, history, culture, everything else. Um, so we will listen to you. We will take in your specific needs and we will craft a, a tailored holiday perfectly for you. Uh, so where can you go to on a tailor-made holiday? I will apologise for the busyness of this slide. When I was previously doing this, it was nicely faded out so you could read all those words properly, but I appreciate it's a little bit tricky now. Um, but really, this is just a demonstration of a, the broad range of holidays um, and destinations that we can organise tailor-made holidays to. Working for, um, as a company for 37 years, we've had the opportunity to establish some great relationships with some of the world's very best naturalist guides. And those are the people who be who will be leading you throughout your nature trek holiday. So you're really giving to the local economy and supporting local people on the ground um, throughout your tailor made holiday. So who can travel on a tailor-made holiday? We get a lot of people who um, think that uh, perhaps to join a tailor-made tour, you have to have a large group of people to travel with. But actually, we can organise things on a completely individual basis. If it's just one of you, we, we can do that as well. We organise a lot for just couples um, and as well as groups of friends and um, families as well. There's no minimum age for a tailor-made holiday. So although on our group holidays, often we do find that they're not particularly suited to some children um, just because they, they require a lot of patience and it's it doesn't necessarily work with the other members of group. But with a tailor-made holiday, um, we can organise activities that are exciting for children. As well as the wildlife safaris, they might go out and join a, a Maasai um, hunter, uh, not hunter, sorry, definitely not hunter, but a Maasai warrior building spears and, and doing other sort of traditional exciting activities. Um, and so we can do lots for children. Um, but we can also organise some sort of slower paced holidays, um, should, you, should you wish that as well. So they really are for anybody. Um, a common misconception is that tailor-made holidays are particularly expensive. It doesn't necessarily need to be the case. Um, we have the luxury that we can use lodges, which are either very luxurious, should you wish them to be, or more basic, if you prefer that, that kind of thing. Um, Sometimes they can be more expensive if we have a private guide for you throughout, as obviously the sort of fixed costs of that guiding aren't necessarily split between a group. But in some countries, even that's not that much more expensive. Um, so they really can be quite reasonable. And if you're interested in a tailor-made holiday, I would encourage you to speak to our experts, discuss your budget, and, and then we can work around you. So to learn more about our tailor-made holidays, hopefully we'll give you plenty of inspiration in this evening's presentations. Um, but we also have a dedicated tailor-made brochure, which is an ideas brochure that, that should get you started. Um, but I'd also encourage you to look at our tailor-made website. It's a separate section of our Nature Trek website and it's full of sample itineraries. It's got lots of information about the lodges that we use, the locations that we visit. Uh, so you can take a look at that for a bit of inspiration. But most of all, I would say, pick up the phone or drop us an email and we'd be more than happy to discuss your specific requirements and start putting together a tailored itinerary for you. So that's enough about tailor-made. On to the main aspect of this evening that you're probably more here to hear about is the wonderful wildlife and holidays that we that we organise. Um, so as I said, I've been very lucky that I've been able to experience the mountain gorillas of both Uganda and Rwanda. And one of the most common questions that we frequently get answered get asked sorry is uh, which which is the best one which is going to make, give me the very best experience um, and hopefully I'll be able to give you a few of the pros and cons uh, and a, a bit more of an insight into what a gorilla experience looks like this evening. So first of all I'll just mention a bit about this really incredible species. So back in the 1980s uh, they were they're 
numbers were incredibly decimated. There were only about 400 individuals left in the wild, um, largely due to habitat fragmentation. There was also a lot of poaching at that time, um, largely for sort of trophy hunting and for sort of captive populations, uh, which sadly, unfortunately, died just because they, they can't tend to live in those conditions. Um, there was there was occasionally, um, although it wasn't actually for meat, the poaching um, for, for other wildlife, they would get caught in snares and things like that. So they really did struggle, um, as well as through political conflict, um, particularly the, the genocide in Rwanda in the early 90s uh, and the ongoing conflict in the DRC. They really do face a tough time due to their geographical position. Um, but this is really where conservation and, and guerrilla tourism has come into it really starting with the work of Diane Fossey um, early in, in the 1960s and uh, later on. And then by the 90s, um, guerrilla tourism really came into its own when the Ugandan Wildlife Authority started issuing guerrilla permits. And so that would allow um, tourists to go in and spend some time with the gorillas uh, who had been habituated, which meant they were still able to exhibit their completely natural behaviours um, and without being worried about the rest of a group. So as you can see here, they really they they don't worry about the humans at all. This is a gorilla on one of my recent experiences, uh, and he looks very relaxed, um, which is generally what you'll find throughout most of the time. So um, you will find that the silverbacks are generally very, um, they're very relaxed, they're not too bothered at all, but the babies are incredibly inquisitive um, and it really is just like human interactions. Gorillas actually, mountain gorillas actually share 98% of their DNA with humans. Um, and you can really see that in the way that they communicate with each other, um, in their feeding behaviour and everything else. So to give you a bit of background between Uganda and Rwanda and the different populations, um, they are a species that is completely restricted to an Afro-Montane habitat. And as you can see, and it's a very small, small area that they're confined to. They do have two completely separated uh, geographic populations. Um, so the first is in Windy Impenetrable National Park in Uganda, uh, which you can see is that top red circle there. And the bottom is in the Virunga Mountains. Um, so that population borders Rwanda, Uganda and the DRC. Obviously, we can't currently travel to the DRC for political uh, reasons. It's just not safe to do so. Um, but generally, all the guerrilla tourism around there is, um, is very safe. We've never had any issues sort of being close to the DRC or anything like that. Um, so as I say, it's, it's DRC, Uganda and Rwanda. Um, but actually in Uganda, that population there, they do frequently come over to Rwanda. So we don't recommend that people visit that Mugahinga area of, of gorillas um, as occasionally if they move into the Rwandan sector, then you, your gorilla permit is only valid for one country. Um, so you would you would miss the chance to see them. So really, we would recommend that you either visit them in Windy in Uganda or in the Volcanoes National Park, which is part of the Virunga population in Rwanda. So then people ask us, what, what is a gorilla trek? What's what's my day like? How does it how does it go? So in both Uganda and Rwanda, you will start at the gorilla headquarters. This is the Rwandan gorilla headquarters, um, which is much more imposing, um, much more impressive than the Ugandan headquarters, um, which are much more rustic, much more basic. You kind of pitch up on a log um, and, and somebody will come and talk to you about things. Um, whereas here they've got a, an excellent education centre as part of it as well. But, but in essence, it's really the same thing that happens in both. In both areas, you will um, be allocated to gorilla family. So that will be one of the 44 habituated groups of gorillas in either Bwindi or Volcanoes National Park. And there'll be up to eight people in your group. Um, and then the gorilla trackers will have gone out much earlier in the morning and they will go to the area where that particular family was seen the day before. Um, so they will then spend some time looking for them and they will then radio through to your guide uh, as soon as they find them. Hopefully it's not too much further um, and uh, you'll continue your trek from there. So the trek itself, you really got to be prepared for a very arduous trek. Um, so sometimes they can be found within an hour if you're very lucky, uh, but sometimes it can take up to six hours to reach them. So um, you can't... Uh, you can't ask for it to visit a particular group and you can't ask for an easy trek. Um, usually they'll sort of uh, 
slightly do it by who they think is most able of the the participants they have that day um but that's only based on where the gorillas were the day before and if you then find that they were um that they've then moved on several miles since they were the day before you end up with a very tough trek so whatever happens just be prepared for a tough trek so um, there are ways that you can make it easier. One way is to hire a gorilla porter, um, like this chap that we've got here. So they will carry all of your bags, um, all of your water. Um, so they, they do make it much easier. They will point out every little anthill. They will move every twig from you and they will just drag you up the mountain if you really need to. So they are absolutely invaluable. And we would highly recommend that you hire a, a gorilla porter wherever it is that you're, you're traveling. Um, so also they importantly um, contribute to the local economy. So these are local people who otherwise would be using the forest for, for other means. Um, so it's important that we make it worthwhile um, for them to, to use the forest and protect the species in this way. So this is probably a site that you would only see in Rwanda rather than Uganda. As just outside the Volcanoes National Park, uh, there are lots of sort of um, terraced farmland um, that, that really goes right up to the edge of the Volcanoes National Park, whereas in Bwindi, it's more of a sort of gradual um, exit out of the park. So some people say that it's a, an easier trek because of this, um, but actually, generally, the, the gorillas are much further into the park anyway. So although your trek might start off a bit easier, it, it then potentially is, gets quite tough as well. So I personally don't really think there's a huge difference in difficulty level between Rwanda and Uganda. Because at some point you will eventually end up in something like this. Um, in Bwindi, it's called the impenetrable forest for a reason. And in Rwanda, it's pretty much exactly the same. Um, so, yeah, it, it's quite challenging terrain that, that you've really got to be um, prepared for. But this is what it's all about. This is what we finally get to is this incredible encounter uh, with the gorilla family. As you can see here, the babies are interacting and we've got the silverback sort of further away there. Um, and then we've got a, a nice group here that, as you can see, is keeping the really good distance of at least seven metres away. So this is a, the absolute minimum distance that we must be to the gorillas at all time. Um, as I mentioned, they have 98% shared DNA with humans, and that means that they can pick up a lot of our diseases as well. Um, and something like the common cold that might be very innocuous to us could be absolutely fatal to the gorillas. So it's absolutely vital that we do keep our distance to protect them in that way. Um, you will find that the babies can come up to you and really got to do your best to try and, um, and back off and keep away from them. Um, but we really do need to protect the, these really endangered species. And then we can get some great photos and perhaps even selfies, um, as I've got here. So, again, we just need to be really careful at all times as the gorillas do tend to be moving around. But um, but yeah, it's, it's fantastic fun. And this is this is actually a group who are birding. They're not necessarily actually looking for the gorillas at this point. But I just included this slide as it gives a, a good example of what kind of uh, clothing we should be wearing during a gorilla trekking. It can actually be um, quite high. It's, it's a very high altitude that we'll be traveling. So it can get quite chilly, particularly as we set off early in the morning. So you definitely want to make sure you're very covered up. As I say, there can also be some biting insects. So you'll see this chap here has sensibly tucked his uh, trousers into his socks there. Um, and yeah, so it's important to take layers, basically. And as I said, the porters will be um, there to carry all your belongings. So it's not a problem to take layers. And yes, this is this is what we're all here for. Um, so this is the the mighty mountain gorillas, and we'll get photo photographs hopefully. A lot of people ask um, whether we would take one or two gorilla treks. Um, generally, a standard well on our group tours anyway, we only offer one trek, and most people on tailor made holidays will also decide to do one trek. It's just one of those absolutely incredible once in a lifetime experiences um, that. Uh, I don't personally think that you need to do it again. If you're a photographer, perhaps it might be worth it as you never know exactly where the gorillas are going to be. If you're unlucky and they're sort of all, um, yeah, not, not in such a nice clearing, then you might get better photographs on a second track. Um, but I certainly don't think it's necessary for, for the majority of people. Um, and so one thing that I haven't mentioned um, that's perhaps the most important factor on deciding between Uganda and Rwanda for most people is the difference in the price of the gorilla permits. 
So in Uganda, those are currently priced at $700 per person. And that's for the one hour exactly that you get to spend with the gorillas. And they are very tight on that as for the other 23 hours a day. Um, they, they are free to roam and they're, they're not disturbed by people at all. But then in Rwanda, that price goes up to $1,500 per person. Now, that's uh, all goes into cons gorilla conservation. So it's all for a great cause. Um, but it it does make it prohibitively expensive for, for a lot of people and is certainly an influencing factor anyway. So another influencing factor that might determine whether you decide to visit Uganda or Rwanda would be the amount of other wildlife that you get to see and the kind of other holiday that, that you're looking for, really. Um, so I'll just go through a few of the other national parks and a few of the other areas of interest uh, in starting in Uganda at the Chibali National Park, um, where we can see the chimpanzees. So the chimpanzee permits are just $150. So it is much more accessible um, than the uh, Uganda permits. Um, it's a very different experience. So the, the chimpanzees will be moving around much more. It's much more active. Um, they're much louder. It's There are groups of between sort of 30 and 100. Um, so it can be a little bit more frantic than, than the gorillas, which tends to be quite a nice serene experience where once you're there, you tend to just sort of stay in one place and let them do their thing. Um, so Jabali is also great uh, for primates. Um, George will speak to you a lot more about primates in his next presentation, but Jabali in particular is an excellent location with up to 11 species of primates, um, such as these colobus monkeys. Um, with, they've got uh, great cheek mangabe, lahos monkeys. So it, it really is a fantastic destination for primates. Birders amongst you might like to visit the Mabamba Swamp to see the fantastic shoebill stork. Um, not a stork by any means at all, but um, fantastic species nonetheless, um, with these really impressive bills and standing at huge heights. So they, they really are fantastic. Um, and a lot of people like to visit those on the way down to go to the gorillas. We'll go and see them in these dugout canoes. Um, so that's another thing about Uganda. There's a, a wide variety of different activities that you can do through obviously the trekking in Windy. Um, and then you've got the water based activities and then you've got some vehicle safaris as well. And we can take vehicle safaris in Lake Maburo National Park. Um, we can also take boating safaris and see species such as the Sitatunga antelope. Um, we've got lovely birds there as well. We've got African scopsowl pennant wing nightjar um, and African finfoot. Again, we can take a boat trip out to see the African finfoot. And then for the more mammal enthusiasts amongst you, um, visit Queen Elizabeth National Park really can't be beaten, um, perhaps after going to see the gorillas. Um, so the tree climbing lions are a really key um, species so phenomenon to see here. Um, it's very unusual behaviour that we can see in the Ashasha region of the park got Uganda cob. Um, they're not completely endemic to Uganda, but they can be seen in, in nice big numbers in um, Queen Elizabeth, as well as leopard um, and, and lots of other iconic species. And also in Queen Elizabeth, we have the opportunity to go along the Kazinga Channel, um, which is fantastic. So we'll take particularly for birders. Um, this is a fantastic experience um, as we take out these boats and the, the variety of water birds to be seen here is, is truly magnificent as well as other species such as elephants and buffalo and um, yeah, other common safari species. Murchison National Falls National Park is actually my favourite national park in Uganda. Um, it's quite far to the north, so not all holidays will get there. It really depends on the time that you have available. Um, but I think it's a scenically stunning national park um, full of magnificent wildlife uh, and also spe spectacles such as this, as this sort of now falls in. Um, and you can walk to the top of the falls as well. So for walkers, it's a great experience. It's the only place you can see Rothschild giraffe in Uganda. And so that's sort of a, a whistle stop tour of the, the wildlife of Uganda. Um, but Rwanda also has its own wildlife as well, obviously starting in the Volcanoes National Park, which is where you'll see the gorillas. Um, we then, so the Volcanoes National Park, again, has lots of species of primates. Um, we've got golden monkeys, lahos monkeys. Um, we've got special birds there as well, like the Bruinsori Churico, uh, this regal sunbird. So lots of lovely birding there. The only Savannah National Park in uh, Rwanda is Akagera National Park. Um, now, that was actually really suffered after the, the genocide in the 90s. Um, it used to be sort of double, even triple the size. Um, but unfortunately, they lost a lot of that land as the people became displaced. Um, there was a lot of deforestation. 
and a lot of poaching of the native wildlife. Um, so they, they did lose a lot of their native species. But nowadays, it's a fantastic area to visit as it's going through an amazing reintroduction program. So they've re recently reintroduced uh, leopards and rhinos as well. So you definitely won't see them in the, the big numbers that you might see in Uganda, but you can go out with the sort of anti-poaching teams as well and learn exactly about the conservation work that's being done there. So for people who might, might have gone on quite a few safaris, it does offer a, a slightly different element as well. And finally, going down to the, the south to Nyungwe Forest National Park, um, which is where you'll go to the chimpanzees, uh, as you would in Chibali sector of Uganda. So again, it's quite a similar experience. I personally think the trekking in Nyungwe is slightly more difficult um, and the, the chimpanzees can be more difficult to find. They are habituated, but probably not quite to the same extent as they are in Uganda. Um, so, but again, it's an incredible experience and, and get to see them exhibiting all these wonderful behaviours. Another thing to mention when deciding between Uganda and Rwanda is the type of accommodation available. So at the moment, uh, Rwanda does kind of struggle to offer sort of mid-range accommodation. And you've either got either this really, really high-end, beautiful accommodation, such as Bizarti Lodge that we've got here, um, or it really can be quite basic indeed. So if you've got sort of a, a mid-level budget, if you're looking for something sort of comfortable but not too luxurious, it can actually be quite difficult to find something at that level. Um, so Rwanda's got a little bit of a way to go there. Whereas in Uganda, it's got a, a very well established tourism industry that's been going for a long long time and it's able to offer lodges at sort of any level really uh, so this is mahogany springs lodge that we use in uh, the windy impenetrable forest um, which is a lovely lodge in a fantastic location um, as we would always sort of choose for an h trek holiday um, but again there, there is more basic accommodation should you wish or there is is more luxury accommodation So I hope that's given you a little bit of an insight into the differences between uh, Uganda and Rwanda. In all honesty, I would probably say if you had to pick one from a completely wildlife perspective, I think Uganda probably has a little bit more to offer. Um, it's got all sort of different national parks. Um, it's a fantastic birding. Rwanda obviously has a fantastic heritage and history. Um, it's so interesting. Um, it's a beautiful country as well, and it's much smaller than Rwanda than Uganda. Sorry, so slightly easier to get around. Um, but um, but but yeah, it's really up to you. You you can also cross the border quite easily between Uganda and Rwanda. So you could even go for a combined holiday if you wish. <laughs> 